Hello and uh, welcome to uh, the Electronic uh, at Interfada podcast. We have a special edition today. We're all in the same room for a change. I am Omar Kami, uh, Associate Editor, and with me today is Rad Academy and Andrew Feinstein. Rad Academy is a veteran um, Palestine activist and author of several books, including our most recent one state, the only de democratic future for Palestine and Israel, and a memoir in search of Fatima. She was born in Jerusalem, from where she was forced to flee as a young child uh, with her parents and her siblings, including my father, uh, uh, during the Nakba of 1947-49. Andrew Feinstein is from South Africa, where he was an early anti-apartheid activist. He became a member of parliament in the country's first three elections in 1994, for Nelson Mandela's African National Congress. He is son of Holocaust survivors, and he has long been a Palestine activist. Now based in London, he is executive director of uh, Shadow Worlds Investigations. He is author of a book on the ANC after the party, as well as a book on the global arms trade, the Shadow World. Thank you both for being here. Now that, and let me start with you, um, despite uh, unprecedented global solidarity with Palestine, obviously at the moment. We are in the sixth month of a unfolding genocide in Gaza and facing the very real possibility of the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians yet again from that land. Are we witnessing the limits of uh, activism? And what can be no done now to stop this? Look, I mean, the best thing I can say is that um, it's very difficult to make a judgment on what will happen. It really is. This, in, in this sense, uh, and in many other senses, the current situation is unprecedented. It, you know how it was in the past. You used to be able to make some... Uh, sketchy future scenario based on uh, quite reasonable uh, um, uh, examination of, of the facts, of precedent, things like that. We are in a very different world. Since October 7th, among the many things that have happened has been this, the inability to be able to see what the next step is. So, you know, it's very much in my mind when I try to answer your question, because part of me would like to say that no, um, it, Israel will not be able to get away with the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. <clears throat> uh, no, uh, Israel cannot continue along this path. Um, wiser counsels will prevail, this kind of thing. I can't say that. I don't know, is the answer. It is on the cards. I won't put it any more strongly than that. But it is on the cards that Israel may succeed in expelling a large number of Palestinians out of Palestine uh, as it is succeeding currently in killing so many civilians, something which nobody ever anticipated. So, you know, if you think about it, what with the shooting bombing and direct hitting of Palestinians, add to it the effects of starvation, of disease, lack of medical facilities. Who knows where this will lead? Now, having said that, but having said that, uh, what we cannot afford to do is to stop being activists for Palestine. That is not on the cards at all. We have to continue, even with this blind, what I'm calling a, a, a blindness to the future, even being lost as to where we are, where it's all going next, we cannot rest for a moment. This is the only possible way forward for ordinary people. Yes, uh, uh, but we have, I mean, I've never seen so many people in so many places take to the streets uh, for uh, Palestine. Is there also, the flip side of that, uh, is there also a bit of a South Africa uh, moment here happening? Mm. Uh, I, I think in many ways there are. 
what has been remarkable is, first of all, as you say, the unprecedented numbers, but on a sustained basis. You know, we've seen huge marches before, of course, just before the invasion of Iraq. There was a massive march in London and all over the world. But to sustain it as it has been done for six months now, where literally every weekend around the world there are huge national marches or myriad local marches, and I think what that reflects is that the political class, supposedly our political leaders, I can't remember since experiencing the late apartheid period when the political class felt so out of touch with the vast majority of citizens and residents of their areas. And, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, in the United Kingdom, we're seeing a situation where Consistently, over 70% of people in all polls wanted to see a ceasefire months and months ago, and not one of our major politicians has the courage to actually call for an unqualified ceasefire, permanent ceasefire. Also, I do think that these marches do exert pressure. The fact that the United States of America fairly recently abstained on a ceasefire motion rather than vetoed it, which of course is what it, it's used its veto constantly to defend Israel. And the fact that they've abstained, <coughs> excuse me, speaks to the reality that Joe Biden is facing significant electoral difficulties, which are in, a, in large part down to his completely indefensible position on supporting Israel uncritically and arming Israel. And where the similarity with the sort of late apartheid period in South Africa comes is <clears throat> we saw the sort of growth in momentum of the global anti-apartheid movement and people coming out onto the streets of the BDS movement at the same time as on the ground in South Africa. There was a campaign of ungovernability involving industrial strikes, involving making the apartheid defined black areas of the country ungovernable. The military and the police could not enter them. And it was the combination of those two factors, but crucially, the impact that BDS and the ungovernability had on the South African economy, and particularly on the quality of life of white South Africans, which deteriorated. And that was the point at which the far right-wing leaders of the apartheid state, and F.W. de Klerk, who won a Nobel Peace Prize mm. with Nelson Mandela, was on the far right of his already fascist party. Mm. But he realized the game was up. He was smart enough to know that the game was up because economically mm. apartheid had become unsustainable. Mm. Doesn't mm. seem like Netanyahu is in that position. No, no. And you know, I, I just wanted to say this to, to you, Andrew. Um, of course, there are many parallels between the Palestine situation and the situation of uh, um, uh, apartheid, uh, what was previously apartheid South Africa. Uh, but uh, the comparison is not exact. Oh, absolutely. And, and I tell you, in, in, in this particular sense, there is a, an additional factor which makes it, which makes the struggle of Palestinians uh, extremely difficult something which um, the South African struggle did not, in fact, face. And I'll tell you what I mean. It, the, the Afrikaners uh, in South Africa were indeed important economically uh, in terms of outlook, etc., with Western leaders. Yep. We know that. Yep. But that's as far as it went. Mm -hmm. And when there came a time when there was so, the anti-apartheid movement was very strong, uh, as you say, there was civil uh, riots, civil disobedience in South Africa itself, there came a point at which Western leaders thought, is this worth it? Mm. Our problem with Israel is we don't have Afrikaners in Israel. What we have is a, a people, a, a state composed of people, w w which have, I don't know how to put it, extensions in the Western world. Yep. So what the Palestinians are fighting 
isn't just some uh, beastly local despot. They are fighting something which has huge reach into the centers of power in the West. Mm. And so, uh, which are not just economic, which are not just about, um, they are much more um, psychological, um, almost spiritual, yeah. quite extraordinary. Yeah. The, the hold that Israel and the idea of Israel has got Absolutely. on uh, Western leaders, and not just Western leaders, many of the populations in the West have now, so, so in, in other words, the foe, the nature of the foe mm. in the two examples is, is different and, is, and the difference is very important. So that's why you're seeing, um, that's why you're seeing the unbelievable cruelty that uh, Israel is um, inflicting on the Palestinians and the lack of uh, response, appropriate response, on the part of any political Absolutely. leader in the West. Yeah. I think there are two things I'd add to that. The first is, whenever you consider the parallels, there is the very important and quite fundamental domestic economic question, which in the case of South Africa, the apartheid state was entirely dependent on what was effectively indentured black labor. Mm to run the economy. Sure. So we, would, we didn't see and we would not have seen massacres and the brutal slaughter of so many mm. in apartheid South Africa that we've seen in Palestine. And it's one of the reasons why Archbishop Desmond Tutu spoke very explicitly about the fact that Israeli apartheid, as he described it, was far more brutal and in many ways far worse mm. than South African apartheid because there was this economic dependence mm. on a very cheap indentured black labor force. But then when it comes to the Western leadership thing, I would take that one step further. And it is, it's a very complex sort of combination of factors. We shouldn't forget, though, that Western leaders were very complicit with the apartheid South African state. But... But they were forced to effectively hide and obfuscate that complicity. Whereas Western leaders take enormous pride mm. and believe it's to their political advantage mm. to side uncritically with Israel. And that is a fundamental difference. And of course, unless we understand that difference, it's impossible to think strategically yep. about what all of us, as campaigners, as activists, <laughs> in some cases Palestinians, can actually do at a global level to ensure, first of all, the cessation of what is happening at the moment, and then, obviously, the broader question of liberation. I mean, in this context, there's also the whole narrative around anti-Semitism. I mean, you are some or your your mother lost uh, 39 members i think uh, of her family in nazi concentration camps and the holocaust informed her political uh, views and yours too uh, not just on apartheid but on palestine i mean how how does this narrative all play into all of this it's it's very interesting and it's and it's at some levels confused as personal and family histories and politics always are. Mm. Um, so my mother was Austrian. She survived the Holocaust in Vienna itself, and not many Jews did. And the reason she survived is her mother was Jewish and her father was Catholic. He was conscripted into the Reich military after Anschluss in 1938. But fortunately for them, he was a quartermaster. They hid in a cellar, my mom and grandmother hid in a coal cellar for three and a half years. And in a sort of a working class district of Vienna where they lived. And when there were raids in the area, my mom would be rolled up in a carpet and the carpet put up against the wall and coal packed around it in case 
the soldiers managed to shoot their way through the door into the cellar, which fortunately they never managed to do. And they're literally still the bullets. They're not bullet holes because they couldn't penetrate the steel door. Um, and so my mom, after the war, came to London where she met my father, who was South African. And they went back to South Africa together. And my dad, ironically, had been sent to London because he had got involved with a non-Jewish woman in South Africa and his mother who was orthodox was outraged by this so she thought she had to send him away um, the logic of it wasn't profound but um, but then when he turned up with my mother I'm not sure whether my grandmother was more appalled by the fact that yes this was a Jewish woman but she was a working class Jewish woman which offended her almost as much um, <laughs> And, you know, very interesting, and my mom spoke about the fact that when she arrived in South Africa, she saw the treatment of black South Africans as not that different to the way European Jews had been treated. And for her, never again, obviously, meant never again for all humanity. You know, at no point would it have entered her mind that never again applied only to Jews. Because, of course, even the victims of the Nazis, of which there were over 12 million, half of whom were not Jewish, but were simply people who the Nazis decided were inferior in various ways. Um, so that was obviously incredibly important to me growing up in a racist apartheid state. And I was very lucky. So my mother would take me to townships illegally from a very young age, she was a puppeteer and she worked at a theater, an illegal theater called the People's Space, which was non-racial, which is why it was illegal. Mm. And so, you know, during my school holidays at primary school, I'd have to go into work with her. But rather than sitting in an office, I was in this theater where, you know, for instance, there was the then young pianist known as Dolla Brand. He became Abdullah Ibrahim, oh. one of South Africa's most famous jazz musicians ever. And he was from a local community and he obviously didn't have access to a piano, so he would come and practice in the theater. And there was, you know, one of our most extraordinary apartheid era playwrights um, by the name of Athel Fugart and his main collaborators, John Carney and Winston Chawner, who did very, very political plays that were constantly being banned. And these were people, you know, I just, I grew up around them. So I grew up in a very distinct environment that not many white South Africans did. But then, as I became more politically conscientized, as I got a bit older, and this is difficult for people to understand, but, you know, obviously the struggle against apartheid was at the forefront of our minds politically. Mm. But we always saw the Palestinian struggle from the earliest times that I can remember being politically conscious. We always saw the Palestinian struggle as a fraternal struggle to the apartheid liberation struggle. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. You know, while, and, and we shouldn't ignore the quite fundamental differences, but there are certain important analytical similarities, the settler colonial nature of, of both situations, um, I think is very important. The, the nature of a hyper-militarized racist state and the consequences of that on daily life, very, very similar. And so the ANC, which as soon as I went into townships in my teens, it was clear to me that the ANC and its leadership, who were either imprisoned or in exile, because of course it was a banned illegal organization, had been in alliance with then the PLO for many, many years. So when we were elected after 94, one of the first foreign leaders to address our parliament was Yasser Arafat. Um, and so for me, it's because I'm Jewish, because I'm the son of a Holocaust survivor, because of what my mother took from that appalling experience, that I've worked in the area that I've worked, that I've been an anti-racist my whole life, that I got involved in the anti-apartheid struggle so early. And for me, the real tragedy of it is, you know, I've lectured at Auschwitz, where those members of my mom's family were murdered on genocide prevention. I've written for the Auschwitz Institute. And to now see 
that appalling tragedy, that horrific suffering of millions of human beings being used to justify a genocide that we can now see before our eyes on our screens in real time. I mean, it's something I never imagined I would experience in my life. And so it feels appalling, indefensible and incomprehensible at so many levels to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, anti-Semitism has effectively been weaponized in, in this context. <coughs> well, you know, the irony of that yeah. is that within the Labour Party under Keir Starmer, I should also mention, besides lecturing at Auschwitz, and I also, when I came to Parliament as a very young MP, I went into the library to find out what had been said about the Holocaust in the South African Parliament. And I discovered that it had never been mentioned in the history of the South African Parliament. Now, when you actually think about it, that's actually not very surprising. Because the people who implemented the system of apartheid, who ruled South Africa post the Second World War, were committed Nazis who had been in turn in camps, in, in jail camps, during the war because they were involved in Nazi supporting militias, etc. Mm -hmm. But I introduced the first ever motion on the Holocaust and its significance in the context of global anti-racism in the entire history of the South African Parliament. Mm -hmm. Then I come to the United Kingdom and Keir Starmer's Labour Party accuses me of making it difficult for the mm -hmm. party to campaign on issues of racism and anti-Semitism. And I think to myself, the world is just completely upside down. I mean, I was going to say, it's only 10 years ago that a Labour-led motion in Parliament uh, called for the recognition, British recognition of, of, of a Palestinian state and signaling and it was cross-party uh, support. And it signaled at least support for a part of the Palestinian uh, cause. But in 10 years, we are now at a point where pro-Palestine demonstrations are threatened with being mm, criminalized. The chant from river to sea is seen as anti-Semitic or is portrayed as anti-Semitic. Uh, Unless it's Netanyahu who is using it. Of course, yes, uh, in, at the UN, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we seem to have gone backwards. What's happened in this decade? decade? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, uh, of course, Andrew speaking as as eloquently as he did about his own uh, origins, his childhood, uh, and the effect of the Holocaust on his life, um, really draws attention to something which is really mm. important for us Palestinians to all, never forget, and is not getting away from the answer to your question. It's actually key to the answer which is that, you know, listening to you, Andrew, describe your mother's difficulties uh, and being Austrian and mm. all the kind of terrible things that happened to her, um, made me think, you know, you and I would probably never have met but for what has happened in Palestine and the setting up of the State of Israel, because what your story illustrates, which is something that I've always thought and that I will never, uh, never ceases to enrage me, is the way that European history, a slice of European history, of what a bunch of Europeans did to another bunch mm. of Europeans in the 1930s, 40s, somehow became our problem in Palestine. Uh, and one, one must never forget that, because what this has done is that the, almost the primacy of narrative has gone to the, the Jewish story of the Holocaust, mm. of the sufferings of the Jews. Of the, that has become the primary narrative, mm. and the people who were victimized and whose country was used to, um, as recompense for these sufferings in Europe, uh, my country, Palestine, 
uh, somehow has got a back seat in all this. Now it's that it's that utterly unjust uh, imposition on 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 us of and I repeat a European history which has nothing to do with the Middle East, oh. nothing to do with the Palestinians, but the way this narrative has been forced on us um, has. Uh, consequences, because you can't you can't grow up I I over on this side of the world with this idea of the of the primacy of Jewish suffering, uh, for which you must always be um, either penitent or, or sensitive or whatever, and and the fact that these Palestinians who are sort of a foreign people, some sitting in the Middle East are all making a fuss, apparently. They want something, they want some recognition. I think it's difficult for people, having it having been set up like that, there's a set up which says that the Holocaust story, Jewish suffering, Nazism, the terrors of Hitler, all this stuff is at the forefront of people's minds. Only after that, you, you can start to kind of vaguely try to, to notice something called Palestinians. It doesn't surprise me that there's been so little movement on recognizing a Palestinian state in a Western parliament, mm -hmm. because this is the effect of making, putting this um, perfectly valid, by the way, uh, Jewish story of, of persecution and suffering, putting it to the forefront of people's minds, and everything else is secondary, and most specifically the victims who were made to pay for crimes they did not commit, oh. and which is deeply embarrassing. So the, least you, the, the less you hear about them, the better, you know? So uh, it's a very convoluted answer to your question, but I think it's extremely important. But, but there did seem to be you know, very, very slow, very incremental progress. And, uh, you, you know, people, Palestinians, were uh, more and more successful in telling their stories and, and it gained some mainstream recognition, yeah. at least. And it seemed to me uh, that 2014 marked, at least in the UK, uh, sort of a, 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 a peak. Uh, but then it went down and went down so rapidly. Yeah over the last 10 years. Uh, yeah, uh, well, okay. let, let, me, let me just say, yeah. let me make a comment about that. Of, 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 of course, by the way, in having said what I said, does not mean that Palestinians were kind of passive suffering creatures that never did a thing. No, in fact, Andrew reminded us of this really striking fact about Yasser Arafat, that, that slice of history oh. in which he came to South Africa he was close to Nelson Mandela. Um, uh, Arafat, uh, whatever else people might have talked about, uh, m no. might say about him, was uh, extremely uh, wise about the associations he made. Mm -hmm. The fact that he put Palestine uh, into the forefront of the non-aligned movement is very important. So it's all of that and the Palestine Liberation Organization, which he led, and which Palestinians set up without anybody's help. Mm. It's all those things that, of course, changed the atmosphere and, and made some people in the West sympathetic and, and want to actually help, and, and hence led to some of these achievements. You know, but, but in, in, in fact, the, 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 those those Palestinian actions were provoked into being where it would never have been natural for a very agrarian population. We must never forget mm -hmm. that. Palestinians were a, a, an agrarian population of farmers and peasants. That's really what they were. Catapulted into, you know, the complexities of the of the 20th century, having to pick themselves up off the soil and get going, it's really it's, pretty, it's absolutely remarkable. It really is. Um, just coming back to the first point you made, which I think is such a crucial one, and you know I feel this coming from 
one of Britain's colonies, how it often feels as though you are a sort of a plaything of the global north, that you're not taken seriously in your own right. You are seen through the perspective of the Europeans who turned up in our country in South Africa. And of course, claiming in 1652 when they did, that there was no one there. But then they fought all these wars. And I always found this, you know, under apartheid in South Africa, we would learn a very narrow and jaundiced perspective of history. And it was, of course, the apartheid history. And we were told both these things. They turned up and there was no one there. And then there were all these heroic wars that they fought and won. And I remember saying to my history teacher, if there was no one there, who were they fighting the wars against? Mm. And why was it necessary to fight the wars? Mm. I never received a substantive answer. You, you wouldn't be surprised. But, you know, and it, it reminds me when, when you hear some Zionists talk about what is today the state of Israel as a land with no people for a people with no land. And you think to yourself, how can people, having come out of what they have, instantaneously lose any sense of context, history or reality? Yeah. And I think this is another part of the tragedy. It's not just, and I take your point entirely, that it's European suffering that has been imposed on a people who had absolutely nothing to do with it, probably weren't even aware of it to a large extent mm -hmm. because of the way in which you describe the people of Palestine in that period. And you would think that a people who have suffered to the extent the European jury did, that foremost in their mind would be the view of some survivors, a tiny minority, who say because of our suffering, it is our responsibility to call out similar suffering of other people wherever we see it. But in fact, we've done exactly the opposite. It doesn't, no. Sorry, and I was just going to finish that by saying that, you know, it comes back to why was it South Africa that made a submission to the International Court of Justice? It's because of that long history of the relationship between the Palestinian struggle and the apartheid South African struggle, first of all. Mm -hmm. But second of all, it's also because we feel a responsibility to speak out when we see a people suffering in the way that we ourselves as South Africans suffered. And of course, I have to say this with a caveat that I, because of the color of my skin, experience South Africa from a position of privilege. So I sometimes feel somewhat awkward talking in this way, but I'm talking about the perspective of the majority of South Africans, that we feel that where we see similar suffering that is as incomprehensible to us, but has similar roots in the arrogance and brutality of European settler colonialism, we feel a responsibility to speak out. And it was brilliantly put by Mandela quite soon after he was released. Before he was president of the country, he made a trip to the US. And of course he was asked by, by various news people who said things to him like, why do you have a relationship with the PLO? Why do you have a relationship with Cuba? And he said, you need to understand your enemies are not our enemies. Yeah. And I think that's incredibly important yeah. to understand. Yeah. yeah. That the reason of these close ties between South Africa and Palestine is also because of the nature of what we've suffered and how we've suffered. Uh, but also, of course, South Africa didn't look at Palestine through European lenses, as Mandela put it there. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. the people who would who had fought in, you know, pre-state uh, Zionist militias and would tell me, you know, you've got to understand we didn't think of them as Palestinians, we just thought of them as Arabs, which strikes me as exactly that European lens, as in, I mean, A, 
so what, but but B, mm. it's just this this sort of idea that there's an indistinguishable mm. mass of people here. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's what you're seeing now. This is what October the 7th also unmasked. Exactly this attitude that these are non-people, in a sense, and therefore things that are being done to them don't feel the same as things being done to real yeah. people. But let's be absolutely clear and explicit about that. This is exactly the same racist white supremacy that is informing the Western reaction to the genocide in Palestine today that informed the apartheid South African project. These are non-people. Mm. 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 Because that's the only way you can do the things that the apartheid state did, that the Israeli state mm. is doing. Mm. It is the mm. only way, because if you looked at it mm. from the perspective of a functioning human being, there is absolutely no way to defend this. And so we defend it through the dehumanization. Yeah. But that what, what that in turn does, and I know this shouldn't be our major concern, but to come back to the question that you asked initially, that dehumanization of the other does something else in the process. It totally dehumanizes the oppressor as well. And I saw it in South Africa where people thought they were decent, civilized people. Of course, now you can't find a white person who ever supported apartheid in South Africa. And who the millions were who kept on voting the National Party back into power, we will never know. They must have all been holograms. But the reality is those people, the vast majority of ordinary people, became monsters. And the reason I make that point is because the vast majority of our political leaders, of our establishment or commercial media, those people the ruling elites who are justifying what is happening in Palestine have turned into monsters. I mean, it brings me back to the question I did want to ask before about the 10 years from 2014 till now, particularly in the Labour Party. I mean, there's been this enormous sea change in the Labour Party, and obviously a lot of it has to do with the anti-Semitism issue. <laughs> <laughs> which was made an issue in, in, within the Labour Party during the Corbyn years. But it's been a remarkable reversal of policy. Mm. Mm. But you say that, but you know, please don't forget that the, the Labour Party historically supported the Zionists. Uh, so, in, 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 in fact, the fact that there were more progressive people on the left who were also members of the Labour Party made that, ameliorated that. It doesn't change the, the basic fact that Labour historically almost identified with the Zionists uh, in the belief, uh, very mistaken of course, in the belief that these were fellow socialists, as you might say. And so that, that, that was, uh, and that, it, by the way, so it's, it doesn't particularly surprise me that... But that is still going back a bit. I mean, you know, the... the, the the image of, of Israel as somehow being a plucky little, uh, you know, communal uh, uh, state uh, with socialist ethos. Yes. It went a long time ago. Yes, but, but you see, you know, we need, to, of course, to always remember that the Zionist propaganda machine is extremely active. It's very powerful and it's very effective and it never sleeps. So your question about anti-Semitism, and then the idea, as you, as you just said just now, that the, the image of Israel, mm. which was very carefully cultivated as, as a, a poor little fledgling state trying to find its way and all these monstrous Arabs are threatening, it's all fabricated by the Zionists. So uh, the latest in, and, one, and it's fascinating, we don't have the time, in, uh, on, this time on this program to talk about the unfolding, the evolution of propaganda on behalf of the Zionists, which they created and which they know how to disseminate, um, uh, which is really very interesting. But its latest 
manifestation is, of course, anti-Semitism. This is fabricated by them, it's created by them, in order to, of course, we know, to delegitimize anybody who criticizes the state of Israel. And that's what you're seeing. So in a way, it's important never to lose sight of that. I, I know that sometimes one is tempted to forget about it and, and sort of scratch one's head and think, my God, you know, how much, what, what else does Israel have to do to, to, to start being criticized? Don't forget the power of this counter force, which is brought to bear the moment there's any swing towards the other side, towards the Palestinians. And you can see it now, very powerfully in action, everywhere. I think there are a couple of other things that I would add to that. You know, first of all, on the Labour Party. I mean, the Labour Party's history on foreign policy generally has been dismal, generally, throughout its history. And there have been moments of exceptionalism. But the overall arc of Labour Party history on, on British foreign policy hasn't been that great, first of all. Second of all, we must remember what Margaret Thatcher, towards the end of her life, described as her greatest achievement, Tony Blair. And what she meant by that was she turned the Labour Party into a neoliberal warmongering sure. party. Sure. So that the establishment in the United Kingdom was completely comfortable if the Labour Party won power. Because to continue this, this chimera of democracy, we have to have occasional changes of the ruling party. And we're seeing that again now, where the establishment feels quite comfortable with Keir Starmer because he is a creation of the establishment and they know he will threaten nothing. And it's why Jeremy Corbyn could not become Prime Minister of Britain. His attitude, his internationalist attitude generally, but specifically his attitude towards Israel and towards the role of Britain in the world and Britain's arms trade, which is a source of massive corruption and huge human suffering mm. all over the world. Mm. That was simply untenable to the establishment, which is why the 2017 election, where he came close to being elected, was such a shock. Mm. And they tried everything against him. You know, Russian spy, Czech spy, this, that, and the other. And eventually, the one that worked was anti-Semitism, because an enormous number of people in polite British society find it very difficult to stand up against claims of anti-Semitism. Mm. Even when those claims are weaponized like we've seen them weaponized as part of what is or what would have been in a more sane political moment in our history, a tool of a movement of the far right wing. Yeah. You know, today they're probably the right wing, but in my time they would have been the far right wing. Mm -hmm. And the reality is we mustn't be ashamed to call that out. You know, when people call me an anti-Semite, I explain to them what anti-Semitism actually is, rather than the way in which they're using it. And then they start saying, well, you're a self-hating Jew, you're not a real Jew, you're a kapo, which your mother must have been if she survived the war. You know, this sort of absolute and disgusting nonsense. And I always wonder to myself, who appointed these people as the new deities, that they can now reinterpret the, the scriptures and decide who is and isn't a proper Jew. I mean, this is the extent mm. of the madness that we're experiencing. Mm. But I think it also falls within a sort of a global move over the past dozen or so years towards a sort of an extreme ethno-nationalism where racism in so many forms has reared its head again. And, you know, again, the irony of this and the absurdity of this is that when we see Israel's allies, besides the obvious America, the UK, most Western European countries, you know, in political leaders like Viktor Orban or Mahendra Modi or Donald Trump, you know, these are all people who personally have quite anti-Semitic instincts by all accounts. And if they don't, they're certainly happy to use anti-Semitism for their own political purposes. I mean, Orban, for instance, the Hungarian prime minister, uses this appalling anti-Semitic imagery in every election campaign that he runs to, to hold on to power. But he is welcome to Israel constantly and regularly as a great friend of the Israeli state. So we have the state of Israel actually aligning itself 
with real live anti-Semites, yeah. but then accusing other people of being anti-Semitic mm. in order to protect itself. This is the sort of madness that we inhabit at the moment. And I think the most important thing we can do to find a way out of this is to keep on making these things explicit, yeah. to keep on speaking out, writing sure. about sure. how these things are being abused and who suffers the consequence of them. Because, of course, the primary sufferers, if you will, are the Palestinian people. But even in the United Kingdom today, if we see this extraordinary rise of Islamophobia, which is barely mentioned in our mainstream media, it's all about the rise in anti-Semitism. And of course, a rise in any form of racism is, an, is appalling. Mm. But you can't speak about the one without the other. And for me, what is so terrifying in the United Kingdom is that Islamophobia is primarily generated by and emanates from the state itself. Yeah, and like we saw recently. Exactly. And that is really scary. Yeah. And so that closes down the space to be able to criticize the state of Israel, to be able to criticize the ongoing genocide. And our responsibility is to try and open that space by speaking out as loudly and as constantly as we can. I mean, we were supposed to be over all this. I mean, frankly, the anti-apartheid movement was supposed to, you know, put the final nail in the coffin of worldwide racism. Sure. And, it, and, and yet we're back to the immigration debate, the uh, sure. Islamophobia. Yeah, sure. I mean, we've regressed. Sure. You know, I, which, which actually leads me to ask Andrew a question, um, very mindful of, mm. of, of us conversing, mm. which I value, I, I really do. Um, he, where, if we look at our comparable struggles, mm. in your case against uh, South African type apartheid, which fortunately for you mm. resulted in victory, and we, in our struggle as Palestinians against Israeli-type apartheid, which we have not yet overcome, uh, how, how can we as Palestinians learn things from you? Is there something where we haven't done or should be doing? Yeah. Or where did we, what, how could we improve? our performance. Because I tell you, it's become absolutely urgent. This is not, no, no, a this is not an academic question. No, absolutely. We yeah. need definitely to have a strategy, an intelligent strategy, to fight what I was described just recently, overwhelming odds. Yeah. Really. And, and can I supplement that uh, with the question of what is the role of charismatic leadership in that? Mm. Because you had Nelson Mandela. I mean, you mentioned the SR affair to afford his, you know, Issues was a yeah. very charismatic leader. Yeah. Um, Un unfortunately, in the world in which we live, and I think if anything, it's got worse since you know the days of Yassir Arafat and, and even Nelson Mandela, who didn't pass that long ago. But it feels like a lifetime in some senses in terms of what's happened politically. I think, sadly, that sort of charismatic leadership is important. I think it's so much more difficult to emerge in the Palestinian context because potential leaders are snuffed out mm, absolutely. so much more quickly. So, you know, an interviewer asked me, a fairly mainstream television channel recently, and said to me, well, you know, you had Mandela. Who do the Palestinians have? And I said, well, you know, there are all sorts of people I could name, but the vast majority of them are sitting in Israeli jails and have been for as long, if not longer than Mandela sat in an apartheid jail. Um, so I think there probably are Palestinian leaders, but I think that because of the license that Israel has to repress in a way that the apartheid South African state never did, or to the extent that the apartheid South African state never did, um, it makes the emergence of that leadership so much more difficult. Right. But at the same time as saying that, not discounting the importance of charismatic leadership, a struggle has to gain traction amongst tens of millions of people globally. 
And I think what the ANC was very successful at, which has caused us problems since our democracy has been in place, to be honest, is we were an incredibly broad church as a liberation movement. Mm. And we were incredibly inclusive. Yes, of course, there were splits. There was the Pan-Africanist Congress. There was the Azanian People's Organization, the Black Consciousness Movement. Mm. But we were all broadly aligned with our tactics of struggle. And I think internationally, the most important of those was obviously the BDS movement against South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I do feel that in the case of Palestine, because of all the obstacles we've spoken about yeah. in terms of our own governments, media, etc., in the so-called West, that hasn't gained the traction that it did in the case of the South African apartheid struggle. And, you know, one of the few tiny slivers of light amidst this horrendous unfolding tragedy in Gaza and on the West Bank, we shouldn't forget, is that I think an enormous number of ordinary people around the world, in the global south it's very apparent, but even in the so-called western world, in the global north, a lot of very ordinary people are starting to see Israel in a very different light. Mm -hmm. And I think that makes this moment an incredibly important mm -hmm. one. And I honestly believe that the struggle for the liberation of Palestine needs to coalesce around the BDS struggle and around encouraging as many people as possible across the world to respond to this genocide by doing things they can do in their own lives. You know, just like when you walk into a supermarket, like people used to walk past the Outspan oranges, which were in South Africa. That's right, yes. They used to drive past the Shell petrol station and onto the next one. Not that the next oil company was any better, but at least they weren't the primary provider of oil to the apartheid military in South Africa. I really think, you know, not that it's my place to give this advice, but that would be my overwhelming focus and also... The amount of work that was done by people like Oliver Tambo, Joe Slovo, Tabo Mbeki, Ruth First before she was murdered by the apartheid state and many, many others in getting the media on side, which is of course much more difficult now because you just don't have the access to the sort of commercialized media that wasn't as commercial in those days where, you know, the BBC, they would give them a platform. Yeah. Even while the British government was trying to stop any support for boycott of South African goods, et cetera, et cetera. So it is incredibly difficult, but I do think that that needs to be the focus and that in a time of a struggle for liberation, the things that unite us, and I know it sounds trite, but the things that unite us being so much more important than the things on which we mm. have differences. Mm. And, you know, again, it is not my place to, to lecture to Palestinian people on any issue. But from my own experience of struggle, that was where the ANC had success. You know, we had within the movement, economically, we had everybody from Thatcherites to the far, far left. Mm -hmm. yeah. and everything in between mm -hmm. and for the sake of our struggle for liberation they all work together despite those differences mm -hmm. and I find even you know in the United Kingdom there are some differences between groups who are working towards the liberation of Palestine that are based here and I just constantly think to myself because I sort of tend to work across the board and I often just want to say to people, these differences, be they strategic, be they ideological, be they personal, are so much less important than getting ourselves out of the situation where it is possible to commit a genocide against the Palestinian people and our governments do absolutely nothing about it except provide the weapons for it and therefore profit from it. 
So I think that mm. would be the overwhelming message. Yeah. Put those differences aside. Well, thank you. I mean, I take two. I take away two things from that. First of all, the importance of leadership. Yeah. Uh, quite honestly, even if it's not charismatic, yeah. even if it were not charismatic, you mm. need a leadership. Any kind of struggle needs a clear leadership. Mm. Uh, and when you think about uh, the outpouring of sympathy of so many ordinary people over on this side of the world who long to aim, they want to support what the Palestinians want. And the, then the question is, what do the Palestinians want? So you immediately mm. are up against this really serious um, and very debilitating fact which is that there is no unified leadership and no unified vision beyond, the, of course, right-sounding and very vague ideas of liberation and freedom and so on. Uh, so that's one. And the other takeaway is, is the fact that the media is crucial because the narrative has been so crucial. In, in the case of Palestine-Israel, you know, the, 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 the real battle was for the, the story, the narrative. Because if you think about it, when this insane idea that you actually have a, a bunch of Europeans go out to a country full of other people um, and really seriously think about establishing a state for themselves yeah. in this place, it's insane. Yeah. How do you how do you make it pass? You have to get a convincing story, and they did. They did brilliantly. The Bible, the Old Testament, people coming home, persecution. We need a refuge. All this together um, uh, uh, worked very well indeed. And they've been controlling the narrative ever since. Where the media comes in, let me just say where the media comes in, of course, is in the propagation of this narrative. So. It follows that if we as Palestinians were able to make inroads into media representation of another story, which is uh, quite different, mm. a story not just about us as a poor little people, etc., but, but to do with justice, to mm. do with freedom, to do with oppression, to do etc., it, it, would, it would help in a big way. You're absolutely right. And the ANC and the broader liberation movement was superb mm. at telling the story yeah. of apartheid in South Africa. But there are the added difficulties. You, you know, very early on in our conversation, you spoke about the difference between the Afrikaners um, and the Zionists. And, the Zionists. Mm. and because of this very complex psychological, political, anthropological manifestation that has resulted in the West swallowing the story whole and being incredibly uncritical towards it. I mean, the South African state tried to buy up newspapers. Fully half of the apartheid budget was off the books. Not even Parliament got to see it. And it was used for all sorts of clandestine activity, including up buying media in the United States of America, here, etc., etc. It didn't work. And it didn't work because the liberation movement, across its various parts, did have a clear narrative and made absolutely clear what the story was. And it was a very simple narrative. This is one of the greatest injustices that has ever been perpetrated against humanity. It is racist in nature and it has to come to an end. For the world to be a civilized place, this has to come to an end. It was pretty much as simple as that. And that is not different to the narrative about no. Palestine. No. But it had a very clear end in a secular, democratic, single state. That's the other thing. There was a lot of debate, and we forget this. You know, in the moment, we look at, at our struggle as the apartheid struggle. Oh, my goodness, what an effective struggle. Believe me. Being a part of that struggle from the inside didn't seem particularly focused, clear, or effective at all. It is retrospectively that it feels far more like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's important to bear in mind. In 1986, when I had to leave South Africa, 
If someone had told me that apartheid would be over four years later, I would have used my training as a clinical psychologist and offered them a straitjacket because there was absolutely no prospect of it. You know, we were in what we called the reform repression cycle, which was absolutely brutal on the ground. And the state seemed so powerful and it had so much support from Western Europe, the UK and the United States of America that we just couldn't see how it would four years later. So you do need a confluence of geopolitical factors, mm. of economic factors and mm. others. Mm. But I do think that a coherent narrative, you can even put aside what comes after. And there is a cost to that. Mm. And we've experienced that cost in South Africa where we're economically in a total mess because we effectively bought into what was then known as the Washington Consensus. Right. And we applied an economic model that is just so inappropriate for our circumstances. Um, and we have a 37% formal unemployment rate at the moment as a consequence, an enormous daily suffering of huge numbers of people. But when you're in the process of a liberation struggle, you have to try and unify around something and again to me and i would never want to suggest to the palestinian people what their liberation should look like because everybody wanted to tell south africans what our liberation should look like mm -hmm. the americans for instance developed a model of what they called consociational federalism that would have been perfect for south africa that basically would have allowed a qualified franchise that would have kept the white minority in effect of power, economic and political. We just didn't understand what it was. In the case of the Palestinian people, I personally think that there is an obvious endpoint. And it's an endpoint around which there is a very easy narrative, especially at the moment when you have the entire political class of Israel effectively saying that they wouldn't give a two state solution the time of day. It seems you are, in fact, at a moment where there could be far greater unity about what liberation might look like. And I think perhaps the most important thing that should be happening once we eventually emerge from this appalling current situation in which hundreds of people continue to be slaughtered every day, is I would think that the broad Palestinian liberation movement needs to have a sort of a unity conference where there is agreement about a collective leadership that will take the struggle forward, mm -hmm. where there is agreement about certain of the basic principles mm -hmm. of what that liberation or liberated future would look like. We had a document called the Freedom Charter, and it set out very clearly what the principles of our democratic state would look like. And I wonder whether this isn't a moment or in the hopefully near future there isn't a moment to hold that sort of um, a process and it would somehow have to figure out how you include the views of those many leaders who are in prison and you know the ANC found out and they managed very cleverly you know the creation of Mandela was an intentional ploy I mean, the prisoners were writing his autobiography while they were sat on Robben Island and it was transcribed onto toilet tissue in tiny, tiny script that was hidden underground in the quarry that they had to work in. And then when one of the early prisoners was released long before any of the major releases were thought about, that was smuggled out. And this was a very conscious process of creating a myth around somebody <laughs> and there needs that singularity of purpose in the Palestinian struggle. Oh, sure, sure. I agree. I agree with all of that. But, but there are specifics to the Palestinian situation which make this very sensible approach of yours make it really oh. difficult. Not least of them is the insertion of this two-state solution idea into the, the, the mix where what's happened is that not only is there a kind of international consensus about this being the sensible endpoint, 
But many Palestinians are also persuaded that what they really want is a state of their own, free of Israelis, and Israel can can continue. That's that's that they don't have a comment about that. But they need a two-state solution. That is extremely divisive and makes it very difficult yeah. to have this unified vision. But if you were to um, to to ask me what what would be, uh, in my opinion, the only endpoint to this terrible terrible story. The only possible endpoint is one democratic state, which includes the community of settlers, which is indeed what Israel is, a community of settlers and the original inhabitants, the ones who live in historic Palestine and the ones who've been expelled outside and their descendants. The only realistic, I think re realistic, practical, f just and humane endpoint to this is the creation of a proper democratic state in which both these peoples become equal citizens. Uh, I, I, I can not imagine any other endpoint which A, would be as fair, as just, as, as sensible, and furthermore, exactly as sustainable and as meeting the fundamental needs of the Palestinian people, which is the right of return, as well as their freedom to be equal citizens in their own homeland. I mean, there is, of course, a huge problem from getting from here to there, which is we are witnessing a period of intense genocide and, and violence and hatred. And do you think it's realistic to go from here to a, a equal citizens, equal rights situation? Uh, or do you think you have to go through a stage of separation uh, without uh, leaving Palestinians under occupation? Yeah, well, first of all, um, in having said what I said, I purposely used the, the, the word endpoint. This does not have any implication of time in it, because at the moment, the imperative the priority is to stop the genocide and to stop the ethnic cleansing. Uh, by the way, I mean, there is a nightmare scenario which crosses my mind a lot of the time, which is that Israel might succeed in expelling all the Palestinians or a majority of them outside the borders of the state, whereupon the, two, the one democratic state thing that I'm talking about no longer applies. There is that nightmare. It's not altogether out of the question, by the way. But on the assumption that a majority of Palestinians will remain uh, on the land, uh, we cannot think of this kind of living together and so on in the short term. It's not possible. Uh, however, it's terribly important to have in your mind an endpoint, a trajectory, even if you make some kind of interim uh, arrangement, I don't know what that might be, always it's important that that is what you're ultimately aiming for. That must not, never be lost sight of. It's the only um, proper... Perhaps, perhaps Germany is a better model than a sort of a separation into two states and then a reunification at some point. Well, you, you, of course, once you can let your imagination roam and you can think, well, it could be this, it could be that. But what I'm really concerned with is that we never lose sight of where we're actually going because there are fundamentals in this, in this struggle and there are fundamentals which uh, uh, Israel has done its best to ignore, demolish, uh, delete, uh, the lot, which are that the homeland, this piece of land, is the homeland of the Palestinian people. Whoever else is residing in it at the moment, that is their homeland. Secondly, it's the homeland of all the Palestinian people. Those outside, uh, their descendants, people like me, th th this is their homeland. 
and they have the right to go there and live in it. Uh, and thirdly, because we want a peaceful outcome, we don't want endless conflict and endless struggle, we will accept the settler community and allow them and uh, uh, confer on them equal rights, equal citizenship. That's a very generous attitude on the part of, very generous offer on the part of Palestinians. So this end point, I insist, is the only one that will actually last because it will deal with the injustice question. If we keep that in mind, as I say, very often, you know, as you must know very well, where, where you have an end point you're clear about, you know very well that in trying to get there, there are all sorts of diversions and byways and, and stoppages and so on, as long as always in your mind that is the ultimate end of this terrible story. From my perspective, the only thing I can say is, you know, we had to go through a transitional moment in South Africa in the sense that we had a government of national unity for a number of years. It ended sooner than expected. But even in the lead up to that, in 1994, there was a lot of emigration of white families. There was massive stockpiling in the lead up to our first democratic election. Nelson Mandela was portrayed as this communist ogre. And I think people were a little shocked when he physically emerged from prison. And there was this very elderly grandfatherly figure who was so wonderfully lovely to everybody he came across, made a point of visiting for tea the widow of the architect of apartheid, who was a guy called Hendrik Favut, mm -hmm. in this little whites-only enclave that she lived in, in the province that was then known as the Orange Free State. But it took people a long time to realize that, in fact, Rather than being a threat to their existence as a minority community, it was a guarantee of their existence. And if you actually looked at the history, but of course, the apartheid state prevented South Africans from having access to the words of Mandela. You weren't allowed to have an image of him. And, you know, when people heard what he actually said at his treason trial was that he fought not just for an end to the domination of white over black, but he would fight to ensure there was no domination of black over white. And that that's what he'd given his life to. And if he had to die to achieve that, so be it. He would. And of course, that was exorcised from history. And the reality is that South Africa, which post-1994 has faced many challenges. Mm -hmm. First of all, despite all of those challenges, it could never be the sort of abomination it was for 350 odd years when it was a racist oligarchy, one. Two, the minority community, incredibly fearful, very, very fearful of the change that was coming, have flourished in a democracy. And that's not just down to the economic inequalities and that they've been able to maintain so much of their economic privilege. But it's also been down to the reality that the vast, vast majority of South Africans are committed to a country in which all the people residing there can live harmoniously together. And that's been the extraordinary success of our democracy is the extent to which that has taken place. And as is precisely the sustainability of the one-state uh, mm. model. Very much so. And, and when I so. look at communities who feel threatened and endangered, mm. including mm. the Jewish community, I have a, an overwhelming belief from my own personal experience and from my family's history that the best way in which to ensure the safety the security and the prosperity of everybody or is, is for everybody to live together equally. And unless one is prepared to have that as the bedrock foundation principle, you wouldn't have thought it was too hard, huh? 
you know, I don't see how we can assume that any situation could be resolved for any grouping that feels under enormous threat like that. And it's just, it's really important to bear in mind, as I said, that, you know, in 1986, the extent of racism, the extent and intensity of the repression in South Africa, I left the country very quickly because I had a report for my military service in the apartheid military, which I wasn't prepared to do. And the night before I was leaving, I was up on a hill overlooking Cape Town and I thought to myself, I will never again be able to set foot in the city or country of my birth. And when I arrived here and then I was in the States for a bit and then back here, you know, most of my fellow South Africans, including in the ANC and other places, were of a similar view. Yeah, it's very unlikely. Yeah. Because that's what we all thought then. Things can change very quickly. And they did in the case of South Africa. Four years later, very inconsequentially, I could go home. But all our political prisoners were freed. Four years further down the line, Nelson Mandela was elected as our first ever democratic president. And that does especially in such dark times like this, that continues to give me hope. It really does. And it's why I believe that even at our worst moments, we should be clear about what our fundamental objectives and principles are. And they're simple, as we've said. Mm. They're simple. We shouldn't overcomplicate the issue. Because when we try and overcomplicate, it's usually done by somebody who is trying to reserve privilege for a group of which they are a part. Keep it simple. I have to say, though, the thought of it being four years from this point to, to the sort of liberation of Palestine seems... Like you say, yeah. you might I, your head. Of course. <laughs> I know, I know. But listen, I really appreciate what Andrew's been saying. I long for such a moment. I really do. Uh, where um, in darkest hour you're thinking this is, there's no way out of this and then unexpectedly things you know nothing about now mm. um, suddenly happen, come together and then freedom. You know, there is a Quranic saying, God knows I, I'm not an expert on the Quran, but there is a Quranic saying which says and God, when, when, in, in response to people saying, oh, it'll, it'll be years before, the Quranic saying says, in that time, God will create what you know nothing about now. You, you see, so <laughs> clearly that's, that's the sentiment. Things will happen you don't know anything about at this moment. Maybe that's the moment when we should... Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I think this is a very good point to uh, to uh, to say thank you to both of you. Um, a, a rare, hopeful moment, and thank you to everyone who's been watching. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.